When Steel Talks, everybody listens. is hanging out at uh, Smash Studios in New York City with Mr. Gregory Boyd, originally a Louisiana native, but um, currently yeah. living in Denmark for a number of years and uh, a yeah. vocal artist, a funk vocal artist, and of course, steel pianist. Um, welcome back to New York. You're hitting the shrine up on this Saturday, and uh, we just yeah. thought we'd drop in on your session. Really like what we heard, okay. and see what's been up with you, and of course, finally get to meet you yeah, in yeah. person. Yeah. So, uh, welcome to When Steel Talks, Pan Out on the Net, Mr. Boyd, and uh, let's see what you've got to offer. <laughs> well, thanks. Glad to be here. Definitely. I'm just glad to be back in the States, really. I've been uh, in Europe for a good number of years, so it's nice to be back home again, you know, and. Uh, my home is there, of course, now, but still, it's nice. You know, my birth home. It's good to be yeah. back. You know, mm -hmm. my birth home. You know, kind of feel that again. So, it's nice. Yeah. So, um, you have an album out now, mm. and um, it's interesting. You're taking a, a listen to it. Is it our imagination, or does it sound just a little bit of a, a harder edge than um, the first one, which was entitled? Uh, which in a troubled time, this mm. one seems to be just a little bit edgier. Um, what led to that transformation, if we might call it that? Mm, yes, it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely edgier. I, I've been experimenting with, uh, well, with distortion and just, I mean, I come from um, pretty much like an R&B, rock kind of background. I mean, I, I love good singer-songwriters and rock music, really, jazz and this kind of thing, but really what inspires me is just edgy, Edgy anything, really. I mean, it can be jazz, too, as long as it's got, like, an edge, you know. Uh, don't, don't, like, don't get me wrong, I do like good, solid melody, that's sweet, and this kind of thing, but another half of me is something that I just likes to just turn it off, you know, <laughs> just like, ah, you know, really get um, that part of your, your system out of you, so to speak, you know. So it is a bit edgier, this record. It has a couple songs in there that I'm really trying to, trying to push it as hard as I can, you know. Yeah. Um... Richard the Troubled Time turned up again on this album. In fact, it it's, it's the, the first track. It yeah, was the yeah, title track yeah, of the original. Yeah. What drew you to that, to include it again? Well, I just, I just love that song. I've gotten such good response from it. I, I thought to myself, ah, I'm not going to put it on a two record. That's ridiculous, <laughs> you know. But I was in the studio, and we were recording it, and uh, the guy was doing the, the session with um, Martin. He's, he just really worked so hard on it. And, and he really gave me this sort of... Uh, like evergreenish kind of production quality. Yeah, about it. he's you know, Erickson, sort of, right? Yeah, yeah, Martin yeah. Erickson. He, he, he really knows how to do this sort of, there's a sort of sound in Europe. It's very, um, sort Almost of big cereal. pop. Yeah, yeah, it's like a big, big pop kind of sound, you know, and it really felt good. And it was the first time I ever had a song that was produced that way. I was so proud of it being produced that way. I thought <laughs> it would be like a shame that I'd put it somewhere, you know, besides in a, in a single format. So I just thought, ah. Let's just take a break, you know. Let's take a let's take a chance, you know. Put it put it first, you know. And so I decided to re-release it first, you know. There was one difference that I know that, and I was really interested in finding out. I'm sure, the listeners and the viewers would also be as well. Mm. With the original track of Rich in the Troubled Time, mm. the pans were much more in evidence. This one, they're a little bit more in the background. Yeah. Your vocals take over. The rest of the orchestration takes over. Right. What right. led to that uh, revamping of production? Oh, it was funny because there was a short time there where I was just trying to figure out where I fit as a panist and as uh, a singer and all these sort of sort of valuables, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to figure out how to make the production palpable to uh, as many listeners as possible. And um, I fell into that. Uh, it's not really a trap, but I did fall into this idea of having pan kind of in a felt but not heard space, you know, which has mm -hmm. sort of been like the sort of uh, hallmark of things that I do not do. Okay. <laughs> but it's but, almost the total but, opposite of the original. You know, it is. It actually is. You know, and yeah. I, I, I kind of felt bad about myself after I did it, but I thought it's such a good production, and it really still is a, a good song. And I, I feel that I'm, I feel so strongly about the song it doesn't bother me as, that much. But um, you probably won't hear it again. <laughs> you probably won't hear that kind of production again because yeah. I honestly am on to this other place where I feel like, okay, now it's time to 
put the pan way out front. It needs to really be blended well mm -hmm. in the mix. And if I have to just find some other producers to help me find that, then we'll, we'll do that. Find a balance. Know. Yeah, 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 and then really get it to where, where like where, where my dream is, you know. And where is that dream? Well, it's just putting the pan in the place that's balanced in the mix that just makes it sound like it should be in the first, there in the first place, and that it uh, is not heard as oh that's a steel drum. It's more like that's <laughs> that's the song and it's fat and there it is. I mean, no one questions the guitar where it's supposed to be, yeah. piano where it's. I mean, our ears Indeed. are just accustomed to those things, and part of the reason is because it's the way it's mixed. You know, it's mixed in such a way where it, it sets well in the mix and it's clear and you don't question it. You know, you Talk about that really short track called Transformation. Hmm. Oh, that's a nice track. Mm -hmm. that, that happened, I recorded that in my house actually. Hmm. I guess my wife's wishes actually. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, oh, I don't think she takes a place to that someplace, to record that someplace. I said, no! You know, I'm recording in the house as well. You know, it's like these days you know, you get your own studio, you want to record something in your house, you know. Just like, oh, I don't think it's going to turn out very well. I said, honey, don't worry about it, you know. So I actually, we went to one of the rooms and I set up my microphones and got everything together. And said, I'm not trying to do this sort of Brazil style, you know. We could just kind of, it's just like, it's just a great singer too. You know? She's really, really fine singer, fine musician. So we sat together and we did the parts and then put it together. And she said, so bad. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. yeah. uh -huh. like, okay, well, I'll give you some credit here. So, <laughs> so we did that kind of in the house. It was kind of... Um, I played a lot of different styles of, of music, um, Brazilian music, and uh, oh gosh, stuff from Cuba and India, and all mm -hmm. kinds of beautiful places, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, take us through each of the tracks very, very uh, briefly, and um, explain a little bit more about where each came from. You okay. already touched on "Rich in a Troubled Time," so we can yeah. skip the track too. Okay. Well, I will say, uh, "Girl Next Door," which you would just was your last one in session yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're working on it. <laughs> we can't get this where we need to be, you know. That's more or less, um, kind of, it came off, I, I, I used to live in this apartment uptown in New Orleans, and it was uh, on, uh, what street was that? It was, it was uptown, and it was, it was my first sort of studio apartment. I lived in kind of a little bit larger places before that, but that one was really small. And it was in a semi-questionable neighborhood, you know. And, uh, <laughs> It was like a loft, they had like a loft on it. And I just had this funny dream one day about this guy, you know, who was sitting in his house and uh, he was falling in love with this, this woman that, that would live in, in the house next to him who was like not attractive in everybody else's eyes but was like the apple of his, you know. Mm -hmm. And I just, the whole story of this guy's idea just came to mind, you know, and, just, and it kind of comes to the idea that everyone has someone that there's somebody for everybody, you know. Okay. And I, I always felt that. I always felt that, you know, you, there's, it's, it's impossible to be alone in the world, I think, because I honestly mm. believe that every person on the planet has somebody for them, you know. So I decided to kind of make that idea into sort of a semi-funny, sort of funk kind of song mm -hmm. of sort, you know. So okay. That's kind of where it comes from. And the next one? Next one is the uh, Missile in My Pocket. And, um, there are actually two versions of it, right? Honestly. Yeah, there are. And there's one that's got an extended solo on it, and we wanted to try and sort of market the other song to radio, make it a little easier for them to mm. play. So we took took the solo out. But um, Miss My Pocket has sort of a double-edged meaning, you know, like the first sort of obvious one is a sort of sexual connotation mm -hmm. of sorts, you know. But I didn't mean that at, like that way at all at first. I meant because, you know, these days, you know, uh, you know, and it's kind of a sort of, you know, uh, we have, we're having a difficult time in this planet now. Everybody mm -hmm. knows that. You know, we're, you know, there's a lot of wars going on. There's a lot of difficult things. You know, and I, I'm one to, um, I just have that sort of thing. I, mean, I just like to make friends. I really do. I, I don't want to hold anybody at bay on any level. I don't care what they might have did. I don't care what their people have done. You know, because everybody, every group of people has done something wrong with each other at some point in time in human existence. You know, we just have, you know. Like, and so that song, Miss in My Pocket, is, is about that I just want to present the idea of just being friends with someone. Like, I'm not trying to hurt you. I don't have a missile in my pocket, so to speak. I'm not trying to kill you. I don't have a gun. I don't have a knife. I'm completely, you know, defenseless, you know, basically. And open, actually. And open, yeah. yeah. And so that the uh, a double-sided uh, story with that would be the man and the woman, you know, and the kind of mm -hmm. the idea of sort of a man always sort of... Uh, being aggressive towards women sexually and this sort of thing, and, and the song is, is a man talking to a woman and saying that you know I'm I'm, I'm not trying to aggress you. I don't have a message on my body. Mm -hmm. So kind of like two 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 sides to that one. But I I really like that song. That one really um it came to me well, you know, and I, and I felt particularly lucky because the band that I have in Denmark helped me sort of get that 
arranged the way I wanted to mm -hmm. have it arranged. So. And the other tracks? The other one is, uh, let's see, what do we have on there? Uh, let me think. Oh, yes. Um, wait, wait, which one's on time? Uh, Miss Holly Pocket. Uh, oh, yes. Forever Love. Forever Love was something I wrote in 1995, actually. I wrote that a while back. I wrote that a while back. And that one is just about, you know, it's a love affair song. You know, it's mm -hmm. having somebody, you know, to know somebody that they, that they get to love them forever, you know, and to feel that thing, you know. And I've always felt strongly about this song, basically. I've always felt just that it feels good to me. Really. Mm -hmm. you know, there's no real special story behind that one, more than I just felt like that. Yeah, we touched in transformation. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's also another take. Uh, is there a double take of original Trouble Time, a dance mix? Yeah, that's a bit, yeah, this yeah. is a bit uh, more up tempo <laughs> version of that. You know, we uh, I've always loved mixes of all sorts, and we just recently signed a song to Strictly Rhythm Records. You know, and uh, we're pretty lu lucky with that, and it's getting remixed by a couple mm -hmm. of major disco uh, d d dance guys. One called uh, Disco Fries, actually. So they remix some other touching some. Uh, things. Some chords there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, did we miss any of them, or do we have them all now? I think that is it. Yeah, forever mm -hmm. love. Uh, Miss in the pocket. Uh, world. Okay. World group. Okay. World so group. Was lucky, okay, that, yeah. one, that one was really nice as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. That's, that's good to hear. Yeah, I was like, okay. Yeah, world group. That one is another one that I feel very strongly about. I, I wrote that actually the original version. I wrote in ninety. Five, maybe. Yeah, ninety five sounded like a great year. Yeah, I, I came out with a couple of tunes in ninety five. I it was funny because that it, it kinda came together in ninety four, ninety five, ninety six. Then I kinda took a little break, moved to Austin and then I started writing a bunch of other songs that were kind of unrelated to the first ones, you know. So but I'm kinda pulling out of that year for some reason or other because those were some pretty up tempo things. But um yeah, that's a nice one. World Groove. I just thought that's another thing. I have this sort of, you know, Global friendly thing going on in my head sometimes now. Although it can be kind of difficult to, to, to you're kind of the quintessential peacemaker right now. You're, you're, I, on the, you know, you're on the musical piece. I, I I try to be. You know, it's, <laughs> it like <laughs> it. I, I try to be. You know, the next record might not be quite the same. It might be a little different. You know, but I, that's kind of how I feel at this moment. At this moment, I feel like we have to spread some some good around. You know, and and just be you know there for each other. You know, in the mm -hmm. best way we can. You know? yeah, yeah. Well, um. Some people, of course, would understand your background. You know, you've come out of the U.S. Navy, especially, mm -hmm. and you were introduced to the steel band through there. But, mm -hmm. you know, for the people who are meeting you for the first time, let's briefly go over your career and how you actually got into the steel band instrument. Let's talk about Ellie Manette, uh, mm -hmm. the person who you really look up to and yeah, whose bands yes. you used to play. Are those yeah. also Ellie Manette bands you used to those play? Those are, yes. Okay, yeah, so yeah, well, let's yeah. get a little bit more to Gregory Boyd the artist and how the formation of yourself as this person that you are today came about sure. and your vision of course of wanting to recreate yeah. the steel plan not the conventional sound or, yeah, yeah. but you know something that has not been previously done yes yes well yeah I mean you, you, you hit on many things there because I mean um, I started in uh, 87 and started playing steel drums in '87. I, I'd actually I'd been in the military for two years prior. I was um, a cryptology technician, copied Morse codes and things like that. But I'd been auditioning for the band the whole time. <laughs> I'd been auditioning for the band, you know. And the first time I did, I didn't make it. You know, I didn't make it twice. I, but I kept doing it. You know, I kept, kept going, I kept going. You know. And they finally said, "Okay, you can get in the band." I said, "Great, excellent." <laughs> and I said, "Okay." And they were like, "But the only band that's available is the steel drum band." And at first, I didn't know what a steel drum was. And my head was like, oh no, hope this is not something weird thing, you know, <laughs> that I don't want to do, right? And uh, these chiefs, these sort of uh, band chiefs were like, don't get in a steel drum band. You don't want to get in that tub band, they call it. Tub band. I thought, oh no. Because I didn't know what a steel drum was. I thought it was a bunch of guys with bathtubs beating on me, you know, <laughs> singing or something. I mean, I had no clue what it was, you know. And I thought, okay, I don't want to do this, you know. So we go to the room. And I had the steel drum set up, and uh, it was really nice looking, but it still looked a little foreign to me. I was like, okay, I still wasn't convinced, you know. I was like, well, I don't know what I'm doing that, man, you know. And so the guys came in, you know, there was, there was a bunch of guys, and um, I think it was about 12 or 13 members at the time. And they started playing, uh, what did they play? They played William Tell Overture or something like mm -hmm. this. And it was fantastic. <laughs> it was you were sold. Fantastic. I was sold 
right off the bat. I mean, I was like excited. And then, like in the military, you can't get excited, you know. You have to sort of keep your bearing and all that. And I was like, oh, in my head, I'm going, yes! <laughs> yes! This is cool, man! Yes! I can't wait till I get in the military. I can play this and go out in town. And yes! I'm just like, in my head, I'm just flipping on my eyes. I'm like, hmm, this is great. Let's do this tomorrow. Sounds good. I'm so cool. So, so we did. So I started playing, you know, and I started playing guitar pan at first, you know, and I thought that was kind of cool, but immediately I was thinking second pan. That's what I wanted to do. Because, you know, I played vibraphones, marimba at the time, and drum set, and all this percussion thing. I, could, I, I knew, I was. I said, okay, I'm going to play second pan, I'm going to learn how to play four mallets, I'm going to sing songs, I'm going to write songs, I'm going to. I just, I just boom, so at boom, the boom, time boom, you boom. thought four mallets, were you aware that? Four mallets were used by some people to play? Or was uh, that just your innovative idea? I knew that somebody had to. I didn't know anybody. Okay. But I knew I was going to. I knew that. I <laughs> okay. definitely knew I was going to. Because I, just, I thought, okay, well, there's no way to do this with just two mallets. Not for me. You know, some guys do it. They're fantastic. You know, some of these guys are just brilliant. You know? But for me, because I wanted four mallets, chords, that's me. So yeah. okay. that's what I just decided to do. You know? So we did. And uh, I just started learning songs, and then uh, I think the first guy I listened to really heavily it was two guys actually. It was um, was uh, Andy Norell was one of the first guys, and then uh, uh, um, Othello Molino. Mm -hmm. I heard Othello years years before I'd heard um, Andy Norell, so I, I had some idea what the pan could do, you know. Mm -hmm. and then I started really listening to Othello. I was like, okay, that's that's serious. that's serious business right there, you know. And I listened to Annie because I just like the fact that he could do these sort of pop things, melodies. Mm -hmm. and things. I mean, you know, you know, he had Stickman at the time, I believe, and yeah. uh, some other things that they came out, the Hammer and couple things. And it was really nice. I thought it was pretty, pretty good. Plus, I like the compositions as well. So I listened to that for a while, and then I just thought, okay, I don't want to listen to pan players for a while. I'd like to listen to some guitar players. So I listened to Stanley Jordan for a while. At the time he got signed to Blue Note and he was just in this sort of fingerboard sort of picking things and I just thought, okay, I'm going to do something like that. You know, then I started listening to Monk. I was in a Monk for a while. I started listening to Monk. And then uh, all of a sudden I started playing a lot of jazz. After I got in the Navy band, I started writing more sort of like, like vocal steel drum songs where I sang and played, but I started really pushing myself in the jazz space. Mm -hmm. like. In my music, I was writing a lot more sort of softer ballad-oriented things, but while I was out in town, I was really trying to get with people that could push me into the jazz yes, space. They were. So I got hired by Charmaine Neville, mm -hmm. who's the daughter of uh, Charles Neville, the Neville brothers. And she'd been gigging in New Orleans for years and years, still is for years and years. And I went and sat in one night, you know, I just worked up the courage and <laughs> went and sat mm -hmm. in, you know. And she said, yeah, you can just, we like what you're doing, do you want to go on the road with us, you know? And I was like, Yes, absolutely. <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, coming out of the Navy band, oh, absolutely. So we went out. I think the first gig was Italy. We played uh, Pompeii. Mm -hmm. After that, I was like, I'm here, world, you know, that kind of thing. So I started working with her. Then I got out of her band after about three years. I started playing with her, her father's band, Charles Neville's band, and then with Cyril Neville as well. And then I started playing with this guy named uh, Michael Ray, who's a trumpet player. He played with Cool in the Gang. It was cool one Cool in the Gang's, um, was still his first first uh, lead trumpet players. And also played with Sun Ra. He was Sun Ra's music director. And he broke work. Uh, he, he started a band called uh, Michael Ray and the Cosmic Crew. And they did all Sun Ra music. And I thought, okay, that's 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 me. So I got heavy into Sun Ra for a while. Just practiced all these completely avant-garde things <laughs> for about, about four years and that was just all I did you know and it was some of the most difficult music and most joyous fun music I'd ever played but it was uplifting that, inebriating it was uplifting yeah, yeah. and inebriating at the same time it was like when it's sort of trial by fire kind of numbers mm -hmm. you know it really was because my chops I'd, I'd only been playing pants for about six years at that point so I was like a kid I was like so many kids in training and so now school, you know? uh, cumulatively about how many years have you been playing since 87, so what is this, 2011 mm. now, I guess that's about 20 some 24, 25 years, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. that is a long time. Yeah, it's a long time. And how do you uh, connect with Ellie Manette? He, he was the first tuner of the band, and he came and uh, tuned uh, with the band when I was there, and he would teach us stuff, and it was 
very cool. This is a Navy band. Navy band, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was very cool to have him, have him around. He was a very nice guy and his sister, you know. And I mean, everybody was just, was just fantastic. And watch, watching him work was brilliant. Mm-hmm. It was really brilliant. I mean, it, it, it's like there's things in your life you don't know what you what you got when you got it, you know. Mm-hmm. That was not one of those situations. I knew what was going on when it was going on. It was like, wow, this cool, you know. So it was nice to have him around and just just starting off and everything like that, to have this encouragement, you know, that was great. So when you need your pants tuned now, does he still tend to them or? No, I take them to a gentleman that lives in Copenhagen named Rudy Smith. Oh, Mr. Smith, mm. yes, indeed. Mm. The illustrious yeah. Mr. Smith. Yeah, I like okay. me. I met him years ago at the, uh, in 92 actually, at uh, Barbados. Mm-hmm. At the Jazz Festival in Barbados. Yeah. Okay. So, Intel, mm-hmm. back in New York, after how many years has it been since the last time you've oh. been here? Oh, New York, gosh, it's been like 98 or something like that. Oh, 99. so it's been a long time yes. before you came yeah, back. It's All been, right. It's been a while. And a while. Uh, the shrine? How long will you be there for in terms of, uh, it's, it's one gig on it's Saturday one gig night, on Saturday, yes, what is it, an hour? It's one hour, yeah. One hour. One hour yeah. And uh, for people who would like to check you out, what can they expect to hear? They can expect us having a seriously good time. I just got this pedal that I'm looking forward to. <laughs> yes, you've been enjoying yourself. Five, man. Like, wow, line six, line six. And um, it's left me a lot of funk, a lot of uh, songwriter oriented music. I just wrote this new song, it's called uh, Poor Man's Piano. Poor man's piano, and I'm really, really anxious to play this for everybody. It's um, oh, it's gonna be fun because I like the sound of it. it has that sort of blues rock sort of you know, thing where I'm coming from. You know, my my parents, my uh, my cousin, my second cousin is Muddy Waters. You know, uh, yeah, yeah, it's like on my father's side. Mm-hmm, and my father mm-hmm. was talking about this all the time when I was a kid. You know, he's like, you should check out Muddy. You gotta, you gotta check out Muddy. You know, I'm, I'm a little kid. I'm, I don't know who Muddy <laughs> Waters is. I'm like, Muddy, that sounds kind of nasty. You know, okay, <laughs> I was just, you know, it's like, you know, I didn't know what was going on. You know? Yeah, I understand. So yeah. later on, as I got older, I was like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, okay. Don't <laughs> cry. Don't cry. You need to check this out, right? So I started checking them out and started getting into the blues and figuring out, okay, let me just figure out how to, how to make this happen with some steel drums in. I mean, that's definitely a way to do this, you know. So anyway, this is something we're going to do. It's called Poor Man's Piano. And it's not necessarily blues of the sort of, you know, of the sort of uh, blues kind of sewers variety, but mm-hmm. it's blues of my mind, my heart variety, you know. Is that the song yeah. that you wanted to uh, premiere for us? You had I did, yeah, yeah. Was it yeah. that you had in mind? That was that piano. piano. Oh, okay. Yeah, Romance piano, yeah. But right. uh, I guess we have to wait till the shrine to check it out. You might have to. You <laughs> might have to. Yeah, yeah. But this, is, what, like the lyrics is like, basically, it's about coming back to the states, it's about coming back home. You know? hmm. And it's like, uh, so glad to be home where my heart is. You know, you know where I can leave all my troubles far behind. Hmm. You know, that's that's the lyric. Yeah. Any thoughts of moving back to the U.S. or you really comfortable in Denmark? I'm quite comfortable in Europe, actually. I, I like Europe. I like Europe. I like, um, well, you know, my wife is there. My son is there. You know, it's, Are you still teaching? I'm teaching some, okay. but not a whole lot. Not as much as we were back a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. We're doing a lot more playing nowadays. And um, I talked for a while. They asked me to do some teaching there, and it was, it was really nice for them to do it. You know, mm-hmm. I definitely enjoy sort of passing along that experience now. It's really fantastic. Um, given your thrust in Pan and your aim to recreate and you know specify your own sound, mm-hmm. have you had time though to revisit the um, or visit, I should say, the traditional roots, mm-hmm. quote unquote? I mean, have you ever been to Trinidad? Have you ever oh, taken yes. in a panorama? Oh yes. Oh okay. <laughs> I, did. I did some years. A long time. Yeah, it was a little while back, but I mean, it was just like well, that was. Test. Okay. It was all back. It was like '93. That's, that's kind of get back in a little bit, but but it was fantastic. It really was. I mean, I was a mess because <laughs> I was trying to be everywhere at once. You know, it was just impossible to just do everything. You really want to do everything. <laughs> you need to go back I'm again, like, obviously. Yeah, you know, you know. And there's something about it just because I mean, you know, it's from where it is. You know, and the rhythms. You know, you get the rhythm just like from the root. It's like mm-hmm. going to Africa to hear a certain mm-hmm. drum playing. You know, mm-hmm. you hear the rhythm. Or oh, going to Europe to hear a certain kind of European music being played, or wherever mm-hmm. in India, a certain thing done is done. You know, it's like you go back to the place where it's created. You know, you get an appreciation of where where it comes from. 
But it gives me, it's inspirational to be myself even more when I see that. It really does. Because what it's saying is people have taken this thing and created this thing. You know, we did it ourselves. Because, I mean, pants didn't come from just that. It came from because somebody said, okay, you're not going to keep us down, so we're going to keep playing. You know, you can take our drums, you can take our sticks, and we'll make some drums. You take our drums, we'll make some sticks. You take our sticks, we're going to make some metal cans. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? It's like, you can't stop us, right? And that's where it's coming from, you know? And that energy is within me, you know. It's like I have to do my own thing. It's like I have to take something that's there and have respect for where it's coming from because everybody does. You have to, mm -hmm. or else you're not really going anywhere, in my opinion. And take that and be yourself with it. You know, make yourself out of it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, it is definitely a really good experience talking to you in person because oh, an interview online is different from yeah, having definitely. the artist, <laughs> right. you know, and catching you. At the best possible place, second to your live performance, your yeah. recording set, your uh, practice session. Oh, yeah, yeah. So getting to see you in your element as yeah. you get it together for Saturday night's yeah. gig at the Shrine. Mm -hmm. it's really good talking to you, yeah, Gregory. Right. <laughs> All right, thank you. Everybody listens.